Yeah, from there we went straight to IM Cologne. Me and Glade flew over there. Um, there was some drama over my team kind of vaguely promised me they'd send me and then a few weeks before said they couldn't. Um, and I had to raise money in the community to make up the difference that I couldn't make because it was a very expensive flight. Um, thankfully the community, this was before I won WCS Australia, the community, um, they raised like $400, I think is, is I really just, I didn't want to take money from the community at all, but I was like, look, I need $400 or I, I just can't afford my plane ticket, um, and hotel. Like I'm staying in a really cheap hotel, but I can't afford my plane ticket. And instantly it was like in 20 minutes, we put up this fundraiser on SC2C. And in 20 minutes, we went over the donations and we instantly cut it off and started sending money back to people and telling people, please stop spend, sending money. But that was another moment where I, I was like, just the community was so passionate. And I guess because I was constantly streaming and coaching and, and doing these videos and commenting on all the threads and helping people, um, the community kind of just said this big thank you in that way. And that was a really special moment. I, I did get there to, um, I got over there to, to Gamescom, I am Cologne huge tournament super excited um i was like yeah this is gonna be so much fun i couldn't really practice too much because i didn't have um they didn't have enough computers for everyone to practice and i was still a bit shy at this point um and all the korean players just hogged all the computers and a few of the uh, more dogged europeans were like no i'm gonna practice for my tournament so once again the early days of iems and old tournaments if you if you weren't experienced and you didn't stand up for yourself you would actually get pushed to the side and have worse conditions i'm really happy that's something which nowadays if you compete in pretty much any esport you will get taken such good care of you. Back then, you wouldn't even have a computer to warm up on half the time. They'd just throw you on stage and make you play. Um, I had the pleasure of commentating with Captain Day 9 for the first time ever, a single series. Uh, I think it was the last day of the open bracket there. So I'll show you guys just this tiny little clip where I already had a really hard group, but I was hoping for a few easy people to come through the open bracket for me to play against. So you know, I'm like, hey, let's get some easy names in here. I can maybe make it out of this group if I play really well. I'm the WCS Australia champion. I know I, know I, I know I lost Oceania, but I want to make up for it here. And then this happened. It's one of these situations where the open bracket allows us to find out who else you have to look forward to. So let me announce that the, <laughs> oh, the other bad, two players in your group are uh, MVP and MST uh, is group B. You see, I didn't lie. I let's. <laughs> is Tomac trolling me right now? Oh man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's get some easy names in my group. Um, so that was really funny. I remember Carmack came off and specifically had the paper folded and he said, don't, he said to Sean, he said, don't let Pig look at this until we're live because we want his reaction if he goes into his group live on camera. <laughs> um, so that was like, I was just like, oh crap. I remember actually I had some of the closest games against MVP and ST in that group, surprisingly. Um, I got wrecked by the European players. I took one map off Feast that tournament. I went 110. Um, but I actually was very, I was, was kind of close in a game against MVP where I got to Broodlord and Festa, but um, I moved a bit too far into the middle of Antigua shipyard and he surrounded me and crushed my army. Um, Nest T, I, I was actually ahead against, but then he did a really clever maneuver. Nest T was like, not a high APM player, but great maneuvering. Violet, I, I remember I had better macro than I felt like. I got ahead of him, but his multitasking, I just could not keep up. I remember that was an eye-opening moment where I realized like, I'm just not fast enough to, with my multitasking to keep up with these guys. Like they're just so much better than me. So once again, I get crushed in WCS Oceania. Maybe I'm not the top player in Australia and Oceania. And then it's like, and I am the worst player in Cologne. Thankfully, there's a few other guys who did just as badly. Like Minigun was there, I think. He did about as poorly as I did. But we were the guys who were just like head in hands. Like, oh man, we suck at this game still. And I think this was where I started to kind of realize that <clears throat> I wasn't sure that I could keep up with these guys. I don't think of myself as a naturally talented StarCraft player, right? I'm just a regular guy who loves video games and tries really hard at them. But these guys are getting paid salaries and they're training full time. And I'm like coaching half the time, like taking a month off to just play the game was a very special experience for me. But I was always two steps behind these international pro gamers, right? Whereas Glade, like wrecked Bomber there, wrecked like a few really good players. Glade was always up on that level. He was on their tier. He had the experience, he had the skills. I was never quite up there um, until maybe much later in my career. So it was really hard. I also qualified for IESF around that point in late 2012. And I said, you know what? I want to get better. I want to keep pursuing this dream. I'm going to keep putting coaching to the side. I kept putting that on the back burner saying, I want to spend more time training. I want to catch up. Free flight to Korea for IESF. I said, cool, 
book my return flight a month later, I'm going to stay in a team house. Had no idea which team house. Two weeks beforehand, I'm frantically messaging people, can I stay in your team house? Does anyone have a contact? Um, eventually, I got to pay a thousand US dollars to stay in the prime house for a month. A thousand. That's a lot of money. I took my WCS winnings and I completely, immediately invested it in getting better. Because I looked at overall my position and I said, I can win every Australian tournament. I still will never be a full-time professional gamer. There's just not enough money. I need to be on the international scene, hitting the top eights, hitting the top fours. I want to be up there. I want that lifestyle. And I, I just want that skill. I want to understand the game on that level. So I continued borrowing money off friends, off Dorothy when I needed to. I left her for a month and a half to go live in Korea after just being in Germany. Um, and I stayed in the prime house and I got wrecked at ISF. It was a terrible best of one event on outdated maps on bad PCs. But I stayed in uh, Korea with Maru was on the key team at the time, Marine King, Bion, Bion, that guy. Uh, Bion was only in the house some of the time because he had a, a code S match against one of the other players. So sometimes they'll practice in different, um, they'll go back to their own home to practice. One player plays in the house, one in their home specifically so they can't accidentally you know, be tempted to see each other's play over the shoulder or look at replays. Um, um, Bjorn actually is a really funny story, right? Did not practice back then. Not that much anyway. I mean, I think the team whole had a bad dynamic. We all know that Prime, unfortunately, a few years after that, got caught for match fixing. A few of the players were involved, a few of the players that I knew, as well as the coach, Gerard, um, which is very sad. But it was already a very disorganized Korean team um, Bion would stay up playing FIFA all day on the computer and then just go into Code S and wreck people. Bion's such a, such a sick beast, man. But it was a pretty demotivating um, environment, I think, for some of the Korean players. Whereas for me, just being in a team house for the first time, surrounded by players, it was so, so exciting. Um, oh, actually, I was so funny when I first went there from IESF, right? So IESF dropped me back at the airport in Incheon because we were in Cheonan, which is a few hours out of Seoul. And I remember speaking to Gerard and he was like, oh, you know, we'll pick you up from the airport. When should we pick you up from the airport? I'm like, no, no, I'm coming from Chiannan. I should just, I'll just come like from my city to Seoul and I'll find the house. It'll be fine. I was, was still very bad at navigating foreign cities. Didn't really know how to do things. Didn't have internet on my phone back then. Um, so I remember getting dropped off at the airport in Incheon, getting the train into Seoul and then just start getting buses. And I was literally going purely off this printed out map that I had got. And I got the hotel in, in the ISF event to print it out. And I was just like lost in Seoul for like two hours because I'm such a, a bad, I'm, I was just like way out of my depth. The city was way bigger than I realized. Uh, harder for me to figure out what was going on. No one spoke English. Eventually I found an internet cafe when I was close by. They came to pick me up thinking I was going to die. They're like, what is this lost white dude doing? Why didn't he let us pick him up from the airport? They eventually picked me up. I'm there with like my wheelie bags, dripping sweat from walking around in the sun in Seoul all day. Uh, and they're just like, oh, okay, come on, white boy, let us take care of you. They had this bad impression of me from the start as this idiot. Um, but luckily, they included me in team house practice. Um, first time I was there, um, they're like, all right, in-house, let's go. Two zero Patience, who was known as Lucy Prime back then. Um, he was already like the B team, kind of lower, lowest, lowest grade player in the team. So shit would naturally roll downhill and they'd all tease him, right? And especially when Patience lost to me 2-0 in the very first in-house match, everyone was like, oh, you lost to the foreigner. And they're all just laughing at him and like slapping him on the back and like pushing him and stuff. It was really funny, right? Because losing to, to me, this guy they'd never heard of, was like the ultimate shame. Um, so this very funny environment being the, the absolute bottom of the pack. And this was really good for me because it helped me really embrace how bad I was at the game. Um, that same day, I also went... One, I also took a map off Bung Bung, um, even though he was rank one GM <laughs> at the moment on Korean GM. I target banned him, I like mass banelinged and rolled in. Um, and then instantly they were like, oh shit, he took a game off him and he beat him. And then like I had a close match with like creator or something. And they're like, okay, okay, this kid knows how to abuse investor, investors and cheese. Let's take him seriously. And so from then on, they would always all beat me, though I'd take the occasional map, except for Patience, who could never do more than take a map off me. I'd always beat him 2-1. <laughs> Or occasionally 2-0 because he just couldn't break my Infestor, Spinecrawler, Broodlord, Turtle bullshit. Disgusting, abusive, low-level play that I would use. Um, really cool event. I uh, hung out with Sword of a lot before IESF finished. He taught me a lot about the matchups. And I really got to just live a life of StarCraft where meals were sorted for me. I had no chores to do. All I did was go to the gym every now and then, occasionally go out to socialize, very occasionally, and just sit there and practice. 
Um, I got to watch over the shoulder of the other guys. Boom Boom would help me a bit. He kind of showed me how to fix some mechanics. His advice was actually really bad in hindsight, which is why I didn't, I didn't take it on fully. But he pointed out that my mechanics were bad, which was the important revelation there. Um, so we had some cool times in the house. It was really funny because like the moment the coach would leave at the end of the day, because he wouldn't live there, everyone's computers brood war would start up or league of legends and they just start playing other games because they weren't they were banned from playing other games even in their social time um whenever like creator had to compete overseas uh, no sorry not creator like maru or someone because he was younger and gerard would go overseas with him to kind of you know take care of him the house would just be like in disarray we wouldn't have any food cooked for us we'd just like go out for food every day we'd go watch movies um There'd be this guy who used to be on the team was like a troublemaker and i can't even remember what his id was he would come in and him and marine king were like best friends and they'd just like run around the house having pillow fights all day like a korean team house is one of the funniest things because most of the guys are like 16 to like 20 right 16 to 19 and they're in a house everyone just plays games all day the moment there's no adult supervision everyone just becomes a little boy and just wants to run around like wrestling each other or playing other games so uh it was a pretty fun experience when i was over there in the prime house um i did improve a little bit there quite a lot actually it was the first time i got to practice for more than a day or two without ping i was used to playing with 200 ping all the time um, and suddenly i was playing with two ms two millisecond delay completely stable I could micro like a god and I had so much fun being able to play without that Australian handicap for once. Um, it was so sick. I started getting way better. I remember beating players like Tails and Ragnarok and all these kind of like lower end, like Code A players, basically. Uh, Salvation, a few of these other dudes. I, I was beating all of those guys uh, every now and then in qualifiers. I almost beat Marine King. We got matched up first in this Fnatic Invitational. I remember I 10 pool banelinged him because I knew he just went CC first every game. 10 pool baneling ZVT. And then um, Marine King beat me in the next game. And then the third game, I got to Broodlord and Fester. And I swear, story of my life during that era, I'd be so used to winning once I got Broodlord and Fester out that I'd always move out into the open of the map. And I remember Marine King doing a 360 degree Marine surround on my Broodlord and Fester army. And my fungals were all like whiffing and hitting just two or three Marines. And they just like studded on top of my Broodlords and blasted them down. And I was like, did I just throw a game where I had Broodlord and Fester out? Ah, but um, it was cool because I kind of got to to go toe to toe with these guys, but only within my very specific abusive and Fester Broodlord builds. I was still nowhere near their skill level, but I was starting to improve. Um, I remember practicing with Creator, I 3 0 him because the Korean Zergs weren't using Broodlord and Fester yet at this stage. Sniper was the only one. Um, and then Creator, there's this cool moment where you got to see the Korean team house in action. So Creator's playing Dongrei Gu the next day in Kodas. He asks me for practice games because we sit next to each other. Creator, mature, amazing pro gamer, by the way, love him. Um, and he's, I just 3 0 him with Broodlord and Fester every game. He just can't break me. I've got spine crawlers everywhere. Pulls, calls over all the other Protoss players in the house. They all gather around his computer. They watch two replays together. And I'm like, oh, I, I, I won't watch because like they seem a little bit secretive about it. They, they, you know, I'm, I'm his practice partner. He says, just take a break, just take a break. I'm like, cool, cool. I'm just like browsing Team Liquid. Creator's like, all right, let's play, let's play. Next four games, he beats me three, only drops one. So we're tied up, four, four wins, four losses. And Creator kind of nods to himself and he's like, yeah, I know how to beat this style now. This guy's not really like probably good enough for continued practice. And yeah, um, and I was like, oh, cool. That's like, it's just crazy though. He didn't know how to beat this style. This guy who was the WCS Korea champion at the time, he's in Code S, amazing player, didn't know how to beat what I was doing. But that Korean team house, when they run into a problem, they figure it out so quickly. It is incredible. And immediately that is when it clicked, like foreigners will never be on the level of Koreans until we have this sort of infrastructure. That's what I thought at the time anyway. And to some extent, it definitely has been, been somewhat true. Um, Creator went on to win against DRG and Codes the next day. I was like watching and cheering and stuff. I was super proud. Um, it, was, it was really cool. He even thanked me in the interview. He was like, oh, and also thank you to a foreign player, Pig. Um, and I was like, holy shit, he even gave me a shout out. And it was really cool kind of getting to see this whole Korean pro gaming lifestyle. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, I saw that it's a very restrictive lifestyle. It's super, they don't go out much. They don't have girlfriends. And at the same time, they are kind of, it has this slavey sort of feel to it. So I don't think it's something that I could necessarily do. Um, anyway, guys, so I came home from Korea. I qualified for Singapore while I was there. Um, I had a really close tournament at Singapore where I should have beat MC, story of my life. 
Um, and then I got super greedy and droned to 70 drones and he killed me with like a, a fake third Nexus, one Colossus timing when all my spine crawlers were at 70%. Uh, I remember that was really sad because I also lost to Mafia in that group, but I beat Vortex, the guy who was on fire at the time. Um, I beat Vortex in this sick Zerg versus Zerg, lose to Mafia, lose to MC when I should have won the game, lose to Hasuobs. I'm like, why am I beating Vortex, almost beating MC, and then I'm losing to Hasuobs because he plays this weird defensive style I hadn't played against in my whole time in Korea. I lose against Mafia because he kind of understood how I was playing and took advantage of it. And I didn't go through the group stage of, uh, of yet another IEM in Singapore. Um, 2013 rolled around, the ACL events started happening. We were playing there more and more. Um, King Kong came into the scene. You guys might've heard of him. He just started destroying me in every finals because he was always one step ahead of the meta. He'd just come from being a Korean pro gamer in Startail. He taught life out of micro. That's always the favorite story, which he, which he told me. Um, so he would always beat me. And then like, I remember ACL Brisbane, actually, I'll show you a video on mute. Actually, no, no, this is a really cool video of ACL Brisbane. I'll show you guys just a little snippet. So, um, I think StarCraft is just uh, super dynamic and exciting. Typically it's kind of like this never-ending platform for self-improvement and that's what makes it really exciting and fulfilling for me. Old Australian and community. Up here. Oh, so he pressed up against the wall! Hi, you gotta shoot the Hellions! <laughs> you gotta fire the plane! There we go. He likes the fact that you can express what you think with the game. And when it actually becomes, like when he actually can express it properly, like he gets that kind of um, really, uh, not, not really a belief, but like a happiness out of it, like how it actually comes true, how he tries to explain himself. Oops. So anyway, um, yeah, he, he would always beat me in the finals with these sick, crazy builds. And I'd be like, what is this build, King Kong? And then he'd be like, oh, it's a special Startail build. It's, it's really cool. We became teammates later on as well. Um, and yeah, I would see the build. I would see life doing the build the next week in GSTL and like crushing these Koreans who were like, what is this weird build he's doing? Um, so it was really hard kind of dealing with this guy who was always one step ahead of the meta, super aggressive, really smart player. And he would always beat me in Australian tournaments. And King Kong, I, I feel like 2013 would have been when I came into my own and really started winning everything in Australia except for King Kong, and he stopped me at every turn. But I still felt good about my play. I was still improving. I was still carrying over some of that, that hard practice from late 2012 for WCS, practicing in the prime house in Korea. Um, I, I tried to do the Code A qualifiers, by the way. I did get wrecked there by Sky High, because um, Kesper was starting to swap over to StarCraft II at that point. Um, but yeah, basically, um, DreamHack Summer was the next big event for me, and it was incredible. Um, Hots had just come out and the game was new. It was so mechanically focused because people didn't really have the strategies completely ironed out. There was a lot of multi-prong and I was just playing by feel. I love playing by feel in StarCraft. I love kind of adjusting on the fly rather than just having a preset one directional cheese. At this point, I'd done so much mechanical practice in Korea in the lead up to WCS. I liked playing you know, these action-packed games, and Festus had been nerfed, I was enjoying using Lings and Roaches and Muters, and I started to play these really action-packed games, super exciting ones. Um, straight away, I was like this Australian kid, I'd won WCS, and that was about it. But, you know, they're like, hey, we'll feature him first on the stream, because why not? I don't know if that was Apollo's choice, or Adebisi's, or whatever. But DreamHack put me on the stream first up, unfortunately the VOD's been lost to the sands of time, and I was up against FXO Lucky. Pretty, pretty good Korean pro gamer. Um, and everyone just assumed I was going to get wrecked and I 2 one him. I did this like crazy upgraded Zergling play and I was multi-prong harassing him and just tearing him apart. Beat him 2-1. The only game he won was a silly uh, speedling all-in where I messed up my, my wall on my gasless expand. And I was like, holy crap. Like I didn't play on stage, but it was broadcast on the main stage. There was like 40,000 people watching or something. Um, and it was insane. Suddenly there was like Reddit threads like, holy crap, Pig just beat Lucky. And this was the first time I started getting a little bit of international recognition. Um, you know, I'd beaten some good players in Korea, but I never actually, it never was streamed to a big audience or anything like that. Um, WCS Australia, people just said, well, it's just Australia. But then I beat Lucky and everyone was like, holy crap. And then I just steamrolled the second group stage as well. I just went straight through both group stages, 
third and final group stage, get a group with Life, Starnin, and Todd. 2 0 Starnin, dispatch of him, bam. Roachling, Muta, multitasking, too good. Next game is up against, uh, was it Life? Or Todd. Did I play Todd next? I think I played I think I played Todd next and then I played Life last. Yeah. So I played Todd next and I was like, okay, I'm gonna lose to Life, so I've got to beat Todd. First game, he, we thought it was we both thought it was set cross map on that old big giant four player map when it was actually any spawn other than horizontal. So Todd goes and proxies gateways inside the wrong main base. He realizes, pauses the game, says, isn't it cross? I'm like, oh yeah, it is. Uh, isn't it? And he's like, well, no, it's not cross because I've just proxied gateways cross and you're not there. And a lot of people said, well, Pig's going to win. He went 3H before pool. Now he's got too much time. Um, and I was like, no, like, I don't want to take a cheap win. I think in hindsight, I probably should have just said, no, we have to keep playing. It's, it's your fault for not knowing the rules. Because I was also confused about the rules, I actually let Todd regame. Um, and then I was, uh, I 3 hatched before pulled again. And he cannon rushed me. And he took, took, took game one. Um, and then I won the next game with some good, you know, multi-prong and everything. And then game three, I am all over him. I've got muters flying all over the map. I'm coming in from every side. It's um, Akalon Wastes was the, the map. That old shitty map. He's pinned in on three base with pure Blink Stalker Sentry up against me. I'm taking my uh, fifth and sixth base. Uh, my, sixth, my fifth base is mining gas. My sixth base is on the way. I'm maxed out on muters versus 140 supply, Stalker Sentry only Protoss. I fly in, I see the Dark Shrine just starting. I go, okay, cool. Note to self, build spore crawlers and spines at my bases. And I'm rolling Ling Bane in. I'm killing probes. My muters are flying around. Whenever his stalkers blink too forward, I'm, I'm magic boxing my muters and I'm picking them off. And I'm just like, man, I can trade all day. I've got 80 drones. And I forgot about the Dark Shrine. And suddenly, swish, swoosh, swoosh. Oh, I'm pretty sure I, I, I just was like, no, you saw the Dark Shrine when it was starting. You forgot to build spores. And he had literally done a 6DT warp in, walked them right past my army, won to all of my six bases, and he killed 50 workers in about 30 seconds before I could get overseers and clean it up. And suddenly, suddenly I was in a terrible position. Todd managed to push out by adding Archons in, overwhelming me. I couldn't rebuild my economy in time. And I lost from a winning position against Todd. And if I beat him, it didn't matter if I lost a life, I was still going to go through. And I remember I'd played so well up to that point. I had this confident, just dictating the pace, mechanical way of playing. And I was overwhelming. I was dictating. And I was so happy with that. And then I forgot the Dark Shrine. I was like, and I wasn't even that mad because I was so, it was canceled out a bit by how good I was playing in every other aspect. I was like, ah, oh, ah, oh, are you kidding? Like I was just, I had this like frustration, but it wasn't hands in the air, give up hope. And then I had to play life. I played life and uh, I took the second game against him actually, um, which was kind of nice. Uh, I'll show you guys the finishing moments of that. He took the first game, Betterling Bane Micro, got ahead. Second game, Roach versus Roach. I've just sent a Roach counterattack into his natural. And I actually, he sent way too many roaches to deal with it. And I'm up a carapace upgrade here. He's up a bit in workers, but uh, yeah, I just overwhelm here. I get on top of everything. And uh, yeah, I actually took a game against life. And I was getting to this point where it was crazy early. It was so late. It was like one in the morning. It was like uh, 1.30, 2 a.m., some crazy time. And I'm like, okay, last game, like you've got to put pressure on him. Even life, even a god can die from here. You know, this is after life was GSL champion. He was the, the king of the world at this point. He was an absolute boss. But uh, I had to do it. And I tried to play him and I played as hard as I could. It was whirlwind. We, we Ling Bane skirmished for like eight minutes. I was a little bit behind afterwards. I went for double upgrade roaches. I was about to start massing roaches. Um, and then I realized he completely skipped upgrades, just went roach speed, and he just did this big roach attack and just overwhelmed me. He was already a little bit ahead, so investing in the double upgrades, I had like a fraction of his army and life killed me. And I was like, shit, I'm out. I could have made the top 16 a dream hack, which was massive. This was a very stacked event, dream hack summer 2013. Didn't quite make it, um, was pretty upset, but at the same time, I was so happy because I played on that level where I went toe-to-toe -to -toe with life. I went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Todd. I beat Stan and I was like, man, I beat Lucky earlier in the tournament. People were, were posting up and congratulating me. And I've never seen so much um, response on Twitter 
during a, one of my games. I got like a thousand followers or something on Twitter, Twitter during that tournament. It was insane. Um, and uh, yeah, the community was so supportive. So it was really cool, really cool moment. Um, but after that, the rest of 2013, King Kong just kept denying me tournaments. I kept getting knocked out early. I went to uh, Asus Rogue I got invited to in Finland and I got sick there and I got, got wrecked because I wasn't good at taking care of myself during events still. A huge missed opportunity. And 2013 started to actually get a little bit depressing until I won the OSC championship at the very end of the year. Just an online cup though, nothing massive. So guys, uh, I've got to finish up very soon because I've gone way longer than expected and uh, I actually need to go pick up my visa from China. So I thought this would be quicker, but as always, as soon as I get on camera and start talking about stories and reminiscing, all these extra things I hadn't even written down in my notes are just popping out. Um, whatever, it's long. At this point though, you know, I started to understand strategy better. I started to apply myself better. Um, I, I decided that because I wasn't winning much money and I wasn't coaching as much, I was having periods where I was coaching, I was earning next to no money through all this. Keep in mind guys, I never had a salary. I never had a salary. It cost so much more to send me to any event from Australia than it cost any other pro, game, pro gamer from anywhere else in the world. So why would you, why would you pay me a salary and send me to events rather than pick up a Korean or European player who's already better than me? Um, it was something where in 2014, I said, I need to make one last push to get on that level, to be a real pro gamer, to be a top eight international event player, to be that good, to be that guy winning money in those big events and those dream hacks and those IMs, getting to the semifinals, eventually getting to a finals. And so I, me and Dot, um, she had been amazingly supportive up to this point. That video I showed you before from ACL, she made that. She was making documentaries and videos of all the events, doing interviews of players. Like the C scene actually has so much to thank Dot for, not just me, but the whole C scene. She created so much content uh, and everyone was like, so everyone loved it. We, we were all just like, holy shit, you make our community so alive. But the whole time, you know, she was there and she was like, you know, you need to start getting better results, right? Like, you know, we'd talk about it. I'd be like, I need, I need to do better. I'm not earning any money. Things would get kind of stressful in that way. Um, and we hatched this plan to give me an extended period of just playing the game and getting big tournaments experience. So I could go, even if one tournament I screwed up, I could have another tournament and another tournament and I could actually get those results that I felt like I, I needed and I felt like I could get. So together we convinced Exile 5, my team, to send me to Europe in 2014 and we spent four months there. I don't wanna talk about it for too long, but to wrap it up, we trained in the MYI house in Switzerland. We trained in London house sitting there. I practiced really hard. I, I played a lot of dream hacks. I qualified for the first Gfinity event. And the whole story of that was losing to MC at every single event. MC was so aggressive. He played so different to anyone else. I just couldn't find my rhythm against him because no one else played like him. MC kept taking my money, man. He kept taking my job. And uh, yeah, I just couldn't win any money. This was the period when so many Koreans had just moved to Europe. It was the worst possible time for me to decide, let's go to Europe and try to be a real pro gamer. Because it was when Snoot, the best player in the foreign scene, would have to beat three or four Koreans, at least CODES level Koreans, just to win $1,000 by making a round of eight. What hope did I have, right? Well, I, I was still positive. I thought I could do it. Um, you know, I beat people in qualifiers. I beat players like Impact and Golden in qualifiers, I beat people like Patience in qualifiers, but MC would stop me at every single live event. He'd always kill me. And it wasn't until the very end when I figured him out, Gfinity was one of my last events there. I finally figured MC out. Um, I was way ahead and then I threw a game against him. I got too nervous because he destroyed me so many times. The idea of beating him on a stage where it mattered and earning money was just too scary for me. I just couldn't, couldn't close it out. And then finally, in an online cup, I got to face him again because I was beating him every time I was playing him on ladder at this point. He just could not beat my nine pool um, or one or two of my other builds as well. And I was like, you know what? I'm, I'm getting better. I can beat him. And I beat him in a go for SC2 super decisively. And I started beating all these players in online cups. And then I had to go home from Europe at the end of four months without a single top 16 performance, not even a top 16. And I, I'd failed at being a pro gamer. Um, and that was kind of where the end of being a pro for me really finished was 2014. I came home and me and Dot had talked about this and we'd said, look, I need to, I need to win money and I need to get a, a salary or I'm fucked. I can't keep being a pro gamer. Being an Australian pro gamer is just too hard if you're not already, you know, one of the very best in the world and then you actually go live overseas 
I never wanted to live overseas though. I didn't want to give up living with Dot and to go live overseas, I would have needed to agree to live in a, a team house with no salary and where they probably wouldn't send me to many events. So even that was not an attractive idea. It's like I can go live somewhere and train, but I, I won't necessarily get the chance to play at events. So I was so sad at this point. Um, coming home from Europe, I knew I'd improved so much there. But you know, everyone's been playing for years and improving nonstop. Just playing for four months straight, it's not enough. It's not enough to catch up. And I kind of knew this. I knew that unless I was actually more naturally talented than I was, I wasn't a naturally talented player. I was just someone who tried hard, but didn't put enough into it. Unless I'd been more efficient, unless I'd worked harder, I knew I couldn't do it. I came home, I knew I had to go get a job. I had to quit StarCraft. Um, I could play StarCraft on the side for fun. I could make videos. There was no way this was a career for me anymore. I'd almost forgotten completely about my initial plan of being a commentator or being a streamer and, and coaching and doing all that stuff because I'd been so focused on this pro game of dream. And to feel that slip away was one of the worst feelings ever. I remember I came home from Europe. Um, I was distraught. Uh, I knew I had to go get a job. I, had, I dropped out of uni, I had no accreditation. Um, that being said, I knew that with my skills, I can kind of get a job that doesn't necessarily need specific, um, doesn't need specific requirements for it. I was like, I can, I can do this if it's a job where I don't need specific requirements. Um, but I got home and just the thought of looking for a job immediately, it was too much. I couldn't do it. I was so fucking upset that I'd, my dream had failed. I put everything into it. I just didn't make it as a pro gamer. Um, I had some great moments. I had a lot of almost moments, but I didn't make it. So I, um, yeah, I, I just wasn't clutch enough. All those times I'd almost beaten MC, I'd almost beaten famous players. I didn't do it when it mattered most. Um, I was missing that clutch moment, that clutch something. Um, and then, you know, I got home, I couldn't face it. And I was like, you know what? I want to say goodbye to StarCraft. Um, let's just give one last go streaming, do a bit of coaching to make a little bit of money right now. Cause I was actually in debt, um, like a lot of money at that point. I kept borrowing money off friends and family wherever I could to try and fuel this dream of being a pro gamer, always with the idea that it'll pay off eventually. And uh, yeah, I was probably like 8K or 10K in debt. I, I, went, I went so far, but everyone has their limits in terms of how far they can go. And I'd gone beyond that limit. And I knew I'd pushed it further than I should have in terms of trying to force this to work. Um, and yeah, I started streaming. I started trying to advertise coaching again. And I was luckier, I was so lucky. I'm so thankful because Twitch hosting just came out and I considered myself a nobody. I didn't, I didn't get top 16. I didn't think many people really cared outside of Australia about who I was. Um, and suddenly Base Trade TV was hosting me every other day. TLO was hosting me every other day. Snoot was hosting me. All these guys who I guess I'd been open enough about how I needed to make it in Europe and maybe I'd talk to them about how I, I guess I wasn't making it and I was failing. Um, and I don't know, these people just for whatever reason felt like helping me out and they all were hosting me and they all were sending people over to me and people were really excited to see me stream for some reason in terrible quality. And people were getting coaching in, in the dozens and I was like, holy shit, I can actually, maybe, 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 maybe I can do this. And suddenly I remembered I can be a caster. I can, I can do videos. I can do this stuff, kind of. Let's try it. And within the first few months, I made a couple thousand dollars. Not a large amount of money, but more than I'd made for a long time. Um, and I was like, okay, people are actually tipping. I can do this. And I started trying to do better streaming, getting better at coaching again. I became super organized with my coaching. I had all these awesome build order documents written up. Sorry, my nose is super itchy today. I don't know what's going on. Uh, super build order, super great build order documents. I had all this awesome shit. And then it was like, um, Bam, WCS came out. I was like, oh my God, maybe I can make this a, a living. Maybe I, I, can't, I didn't make it as a pro, but maybe I have a spot in the scene. I remember just being so blown away. Like every time anyone tipped me money on Twitch, I didn't feel like I deserved it at all because my self-esteem was actually really low. I felt like I had failed really badly. Um, and the fact that I'd spent so much money and pushed it so far trying to make it, it was... it was over. So every time someone was like, no, you're great, do this. You should cast more, you should do this more. I, I, I was really awkward about it and I couldn't accept, I couldn't accept people's gratitude and that people actually appreciated me doing non-pro player stuff and that I explained the game in a particular way. Holy shit guys, sorry, my nose is like insanely itchy. I'm not picking, I swear. I'm doing that. I don't know why. Um, so I, I just couldn't accept it. Um, but I, I steadily got used to it. I started playing um, a lot on stream, getting a bigger audience. 
and I started to, to hatch plans of how to do things better. I started doing like a replay analysis show where people could submit replays on Reddit, anyone could, and I'd analyze the replays on stream and talk about what they could do better and explain certain concepts. I'd say, okay guys, send in your ZVT replays or send in your, your macro ZVP replays so I can talk about what you can do better. And people like started coming in, sending replays by the droves and I saw, people started getting really um, committed, I guess, to watching the stream. I got a sub button. Um, WCS got announced and they're like, oh, by the way, you can actually win a lot of money just by coming, but just by being the best in Australia again. And I was like, holy shit, I can actually be the best in Australia. I know I can win Australian things, not necessarily consistently, but I can do that while streaming and doing YouTube and all this other stuff and coaching. And I started doing all this and, and suddenly I, I somehow fell into where I am now. I, I messed up and didn't train hard enough for season two and got wrecked in WCS. Um, and I ended up here. Before that, I did get one last hurrah, one last moment. Um, which I would like to share with you guys. So um, let me just show you guys my last hurrah in StarCraft 2, which was WCS making it to the round of 16 over in Germany in the new WCS system where you know I was considering myself a caster at this point. I was considering myself not really a pro player anymore. And to have the opportunity to fly to Germany to compete, it was incredible. I was like, holy shit, I can't believe I'm getting this chance. And I wasn't the best prepared. I'd been spending a lot of time streaming and playing uh, and doing videos and coaching, but to make it to the round of 16 was beside behind WCS 2012, probably the, the second best memory in my career. And you guys might remember this celebration. That, that was very, very well played by him. Really coming into this group and making a statement from the start of the group. He Wrong video. <laughs> That's not the right video. That's when he beat me in the first series. He pushed pig aside. <laughs> he pushed pig aside. Sorry guys, I thought I had all the videos ready and timestamped. Apparently I didn't on this one. All right, here we go. Where I did my roach drop into Nidus, a Jadong build, a really disgusting all in. Down so far in terms of supply. So you I can't believe this. I, I can't believe it. Kane did it, and now Pig's doing it after two really, for them, painful games oh, against no. Happy. Happy's going to have to change his name after today because this is a the disaster. The tank is gone. It's the tank fall. is gone. It's going to fall. There's more roaches piling on through. Happy. GG. And Pig. Oh, see, oh, see, oh, see. <laughs> Pig makes his way through to the round of 16. I can't believe it. I can't believe how today has played out, and neither can that man on screen. He is so happy with his <laughs> victory there. Ecstatic. Aw. That's, um... <laughs> a lot of Red Bull and not really expecting yourself to go through. That's that's the reaction that you get. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I was, um, I was just so honored to be there, to get flown over there to play. Um, I, I kind of still wasn't fully out of pro gaming yet, though realistically I should have really had my expectations lowered. I went to the round of 16, um, I cheesed Showtime first map, I was up game two and I let it slip away. Um, he played incredibly well, Showtime's a godlike player. Um, I was playing Max Ed, and there was a hotkey issue, thanks Battle.net, um, and somehow Pulse hotkeys got onto mine, even though we were swapping SSDs. So there should be no way that Pulse hotkeys were on mine, but they were so similar to mine, I didn't realize till a few minutes into my game, and somehow that tilted me, and I started playing way below my level, and it's not an excuse. Max Ed probably would have beaten me either way, but it's something where I talked to you guys before about how when I play below my level, it's the worst feeling in the world. If you play your level and you lose, like at DreamHack, yes, I missed the Dark Shrine. Yes, I should have caught that and I should have beat Todd. But I played well overall, so I was still able to get over the, the disappointment within a few minutes and, and bounce back and be like, you know, I played well, I'm going to do better next time. I could have that attitude. Whenever I played below my level like I did at this tournament, and it's partly because I just wasn't that well prepared. I was spending so much time doing streaming and coaching because that I had to do that. I was starting to pay back my debts. That was, that was how I was making my money. It was the only way I could buy food and all that sort of stuff and, and try and you know, provide a, a lifestyle um, to, to me and Dot. Um, obviously she works as well. She was the one who'd been like the, the one wearing the pants and, and paying for everything up to that point. So yeah, being able to, um, to go there and play, I hadn't lowered my expectations. I got wrecked by Max Ed. I played way below my level and probably the most emotional I've after, been after a loss was that, partly because I probably knew somewhere that it, I don't think I did know that it was going to be my last big hurrah. Um, I remember 
the admin, um, I think it was Graham, no offense Graham, Graham's a friend, but he was kind of trying to blame me, saying it must have been my fault with the hotkeys, it's just a, it, which is why they screwed up, because I was a bit annoyed and I kind of said something passive aggressive to him. Um, and he was like just trying to blame me and being quite aggressive about it. Um, and I remember I was so distraught over to losing, I was like either about to punch him or I was about to cry. Um, and I ended up just storming off and people were saying stuff to me and I just couldn't even look at people. I couldn't respond. Uh, I went I went to the bathroom and I actually cried in a cubicle for like 10 minutes. Um, that's the only time I've like tears running down my cheeks cried after a loss. Um, and I called Dot and I basically was like, I can't believe I played so shit. Um, you know, I'm so disappointed in myself. This meant so much to me. And that was the last time really where I got to feel that disappointment. Um, you know, it's kind of beautiful thinking about it because <laughs> you don't ever care about anything as much as when you care about winning at StarCraft or winning at anything that you put that much of your life into. You put so much of your life on hold. I told you guys, it probably wasn't until 2014 when I started having the idea of weekends where I'd take one day off a week where I would only be allowed to watch StarCraft and I'd still just probably watch tournaments most of the day. Um, it wasn't until like 2014 where I started trying to give myself social activities again. It was like four years where I just didn't go out. All I did was StarCraft. In hindsight, it was a stupid way to do things, but it's because it was all that mattered to me and I didn't have any money for anything else. And I, I put everything I had into this game and I wanted to be the best and I failed at it. And this was probably the moment, I guess, where the biggest, most upsetting fail happened all in one big moment on one big stage. And it all came out and it came rushing out of me because I played well below my skill level. And that's nothing like that. Nothing sets me off like that. So I was very sad. That was my last hurrah um, in WCS. Um, after that, I, I lost in Challenger season two, as I said, luckily they invited me to commentate and then they kept inviting me to commentate and analyze. And I, I'm, I'm so lucky to have fallen straight into commentary because I was still in debt um, at the end of 2015 last year. I paid back everybody I owed money. Um, I, I earned more money in the last year than I did probably in my entire career as a pro gamer, simply because I was coaching and casting and people were kind enough to sub to my stream. And I actually um, live in a room, uh, I was living in a house that was infested with mold and literally falling apart behind around me. I now live in a house that is not crazy expensive. I have housemates and stuff, but it's actually clean. I go out, I eat food, I exercise. You can see I'm much healthier. I've lost 15 kilograms. Um, in a way, I'm a lot happier now that I'm not competing um, because I'm doing all those other things, but I, I still wouldn't change anything other than the ability to go back and do exactly what I did the same, but better. To train harder, to work harder, maybe to put even more of my money into just playing rather than coaching and just trying to go for one concentrated burst in the early days of getting to the top level, securing that salary and taking it from there. I wouldn't change a thing. It's beautiful what I learned from this. And like I said earlier, guys, my whole story here in StarCraft, it's about getting punched in the face and falling over. It's about playing with 200 ping from Australia and just getting wrecked in every qualifier you try to play for WCS. Um, it's about being 2-0 up on crank and then losing three games in a row and wanting to kill yourself, kill myself. Um, not literally, but you know, like having the just terrible thoughts being down on myself. Um, feeling after so many losses, like I, I wasn't good enough. And then somehow finding a way to direct myself into a positive line of thought and motivate myself to get back up and continue. To play against pro gamers who'd been playing for decades longer than me, for years longer than me. To play against pro gamers who had salaries when I never got one, who had more opportunities to go to these tournaments, most importantly, though, it was about me overcoming my own weakness. I can blame all those handicaps as much as I want, but the number one thing that always holds you back is yourself. And what I learned throughout this whole journey was that I'm a lazy piece of shit if I don't motivate myself really well. I need to work super hard. I've learned to get so much better at scheduling things, at being good at actually giving myself time off, not just going super hard at something to the point where I burn out and then I'm not consistent. I learned how to feel terrible about something, to lose every single, like, like I put everything for years into being a pro gamer and I didn't achieve it. I failed miserably, but because at every moment I kept trying hard and I kept showing up and trying to put in the effort. And at the same time, I enjoyed myself and I socialized and networked. Um, and I did learn so much about the game that I was 
almost magically without even planning it, I had options. I macroed at life. Essentially, I macroed at StarCraft. I didn't put all my eggs just in one basket. I gave myself options. You know, it wasn't actually an all in in some regards because I did commentate and I did network and I did talk to people while I was pro playing. Luckily, I was able to kind of change path, be flexible, react to the shitty all in of me being not good enough as a pro player. And I reacted and I ended up now as a commentator. And um, the fact that I've been able to do that is glorious. I do honestly think that because I learned how to get back up and move my skills in other directions and apply myself way harder than I'd ever applied myself at anything before, I think StarCraft taught me how to actually move in that direction. It taught me how to apply myself. So even if I wasn't in StarCraft now, I had to quit, I had to get a job. I'm utterly convinced that I would be moving up in that profession, that I would be finding build orders to progress constantly. I would be analyzing myself and looking for mistakes. I do this with everything I do now. I apply StarCraft. I'm always there with a notepad writing down what I can do better. I'm always watching replays, whether it's a replay of commentary or something else, and think, ah, you know what? I think I can do that better. Okay, even no matter how small it is. Um, and I think, you know, I, I wrote this really wanky saying on my Instagram um, bio, because I saw everyone has wanky sayings on Instagram. So I decided to write one and it was always seek to improve no matter how good you think you are. Um, and I think that's what I've got out of Starcraft. No matter how big a victory, you will always, there will always be someone waiting to knock you flat on your ass. Um, your being good is so relational. It's, it's so perspective based. It doesn't really mean anything, but as long as you constantly seek to be better, you almost inevitably become a better person as long as you do it in a positive way. So for me, StarCraft has been a journey. It's been, uh, it's been fucking incredible. I've loved it. I love all of you guys. I'm probably going to split this into three one hour VODs because that's how long we've gone. Holy shit. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for watching. I love all of you. I love StarCraft. Learning how to understand strategy and understand that strategy isn't about putting all your eggs in one basket. It's about macro. That's the solid way to, to build up. Um, you know, it's been a, a revelation learning about strategy as I went on and just how to play stronger mechanically, how to adjust, how to look at the meta, how to adapt. There's so many complex things I learned, which I haven't even talked about yet, but hopefully I can talk about those in future dailies and elucidate all the details of StarCraft. It's been a journey. Thank you so much, you guys who are actually crazy enough to still be watching this video. I love all of you. I love StarCraft. I'm going to leave you guys um, with a couple of amazing, just stupid video flashbacks, a bit of cringe, a bit of humor um, before I say my goodbye. You don't need to eat much, just, just pull a bit of... This is, this is me feeding durian to people at IEM Singapore in 2013, where whenever I was knocked out of a tournament, I was always making content, doing interviews. I was always playing, you know, getting people to yeah. eat weird things. Durian smells terrible, by the way, but it tastes really good. Um, well, I'd say like 30% of people really like it. The taste is pretty okay. It's, yeah, it's weird, right? The, 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 the smell. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Greg. Um, my very, the precursor of the daily here from 2011, December, the pig's point of view show. Which is old 30 Zerglings, hell's no. So that's why the Baneling Nest is the kind of preferred standard. <laughs> Eldred TV says, if I had... <laughs> Look at how shit that is, guys. So no matter how many problems I have on my stream these days, just perspective is everything. <laughs> and finally, you guys ready for some cringe? After the message. Well, I, I guess because you, you, what you've said is that... This is a TV interview, by the way, on ABC News 24. Yes, that's me. That's my friend, Nick. Nick Jordan, he's a food writer these days. He was a journalism student at the time. Him and his friend, they made a, um, a documentary, including me, and about esports and StarCraft. And uh, part of it got aired here on this news, and they did a little filler interview with us on TV. The, you know, the, the stereotypical uh, image of a gamer is someone who's stuck in a dark room, doesn't see much light, doesn't eat well, uh, and perhaps is, is a bit of a social recluse. Is that you? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's what some people who have uh, vaguely heard, heard about what I do, that's the first thing that jumps to their mind. But uh, I think there's, uh, there's different types of gamers. When it gets to professional gaming, you're playing competitively, and it's, it's very similar to any other competitive. That's right. You give that professional response, boy. You tell those, <laughs> tell those older news-watching people. It's legit. Ah. Um, all these videos that I've been showing, by the way, the vast majority of them are on my YouTube channel if you go back far enough through it. Um, 
But anyway, guys, thank you so much for hanging out. I love all of you. No matter how good you think you are, always seek to improve and be a better person. Be positive, be happy, enjoy StarCraft, spread the love of strategy games and um, you know, learn and develop yourself into a better person through them. Thank you so much for hanging out, guys. Don't forget to hug a cactus, a lick a walrus, and of course, punch a watermelon to the moon. I'll catch you guys next time. Goodbye and good night. Pew!